Israel gets a big fish in Beirut. The Palestinian Authority is digging attack tunnels in Judea and Samaria. The United States is going to war against Israel's cabinet ministers, apparently forgetting that they actually represent voters. And that leaves us with the last thing, which is that the Israeli Supreme Court has decided that the people of Israel are unconstitutional. I'll have details on all that coming up on In Focus. Tuesday evening, we received word that an unmanned uh, aerial vehicle uh, shot three missiles at Hamas's offices in Beirut. A number of people were killed, and as the hours passed, it became apparent that the primary target who was hit was Salah al uh one of the top ha Hamas leaders. He's really been likened to the Suleimani, the Qasem Suleimani, of uh, of Hamas in the sense that he was the strategist of Hamas. Salah Hawari was a number of things. The first thing that he was was the commander of Hamas in Judea and Samaria. He oversaw, directed terrorist attacks in Judea and Samaria that over the past year killed 35 Israelis. He was the architect of the 2014 kidnap and murder of three teenagers outside of the community of Elon Shvut in, um, in the Etzion block in uh, Judea, uh, just south of Jerusalem. The kidnapping of the three teenagers provoked what became the Israel-Hamas War of 2014. Um, so he has an enormous amount of blood on his hands. He was also the architect, of course, of the October 7th uh, invasion of Israel from Gaza and the uh, slaughter of 1,200 Israelis and the taking of 240 Israelis captive in Gaza, or one of the architects. Um, the main thing that he's known for is that Salah Khauri is also the architect of the transformation of Hamas into a full-blown Iranian proxy. For many years, Iran had been funding and training and arming Hamas, but Hamas only became a full-fledged Iranian proxy at Salah Khauri's direction over the past couple of years, uh, where it became uh, just another a full-fledged member in Iran's terror nexus. So he was a very, very important person in Hamas, and now he's gone, which is a great thing. Um, Israel is not taking responsibility for the assassination. The IDF spokesperson in his briefing last night uh, specifically said, twice in the same briefing that Israel is focused on Hamas, as if to say to Hezbollah in Lebanon, um, we're not targeting you. We said that we were going to kill every single Hamas leader, um, and we're doing that, and this has nothing to do with you. It's true that it happened in the Dafia court, court, quarter of Beirut, uh, which is your operational headquarters, to be sure, but this is an attack against Hamas, so you can walk away uh, quietly from the table and not uh, enter into a much higher intensity uh, phase of the current war that you're fighting against us. And in fact, uh, just moments before I started this recording on Wednesday afternoon, um, Hezbollah put out a statement that said that they're going to respond from Lebanon to the attack, uh, to the assassination of al Ruri, but they're not going to give Israel any sort of prize. They're not going to play by Israel's dance card, and they're not going to uh, increase in a major way the intensity of the war that they're already waging against the Jewish state. So it seems that Hezbollah also is not interesting right now in uh, increasing the intensity of the fight uh, that it's waging against Israel. And there are a bunch of different explanations for them. We're not going to go into them too deeply today because we've got a lot of ground to cover. But one of them is just that Hezbollah appears to be completely coordinated, as always, with Iran. But here, in this case, with Iran's nuclear clock. Um, last week, we got the reports that Iran is massively expanding its nuclear enrichment, its uranium enrichment to 60%, which is uh, near weapons grade. And the sense, we talked about this in the previous uh, episode of In Focus, seems to be that Iran wants a cascade effect. It wants break. It wants to announce that it's reached breakout with an arsenal as opposed to with one 
uh, nuke so that then Hezbollah, once that happens, or in tandem with that happening, uh, Hezbollah would have its major war. But here it's very important that the assassination of al aruri happened on the eve of the fourth anniversary of the U.S. assassination of Qasem Soleimani. Um, and so that may have also, by killing him, Israel may have preempted another escalation on the part of Hezbollah because they like to do escalations on the anniversary of his assassination. So we'll just have to see where this is playing out. We also just got a report literally like the, the minute before I started this recording that there was an explosion by Soleimani's uh, tomb in Iran uh, just before the memorial ceremony for him and the 20 people were killed. That sounds more like something that uh, regime opponents would have done uh, in Tehran because there's no operational uh, significance of something like that, I don't think, unless it's Khamenei who was killed. But, you know, it's way too early to begin speculations. At any rate, this was a significant day, just as the attack, the invasion of Israel and Simchat Torah on uh, just uh, the day after the 50th anniversary of the Egyptian-Syrian invasion that became known as the Yom Kippur War of 1973 occurred. So anniversaries are very important uh, in the Middle East, and so we can chalk it up to that. The war, though, is far from over. Killing or worry is not a war ender. It's just an important marking. It's a signpost, an important one in the war that shows what Israel's capabilities are in Beirut and throughout the world. Um, as we continue to plow on, in our war to eradicate the Hamas regime in Judea, and, in, uh, not in Judea and Samaria, but in uh, Gaza. And the focus of that war right now is in Khan Yunus, in the major town of Khan Yunus, which is one of the operational hubs of Hamas. It's where we assume that uh, the leadership on the ground, the uh, terror masters of Hamas are located in the subterranean tunnels and that they're uh, using the hostages as their shields for Israeli attacks. And there's a major concentration by Israeli special forces now in Khan Yunus inside of the tunnels themselves in Khan Yunus. So we're seeing a lot of operations there. We just lost another son, another son, another son of parents. Um, another soldier this morning, is, his death was announced uh, from the Yalom Engineering Corps uh, Commando Unit that operates inside of the tunnel. So... Uh, the war is not, and by any stretch of the imagination, over. We also haven't gone to Rafah, which is a town that abuts Egypt, and there's really going to be no way to declare victory or, or whatever over Hamas without control over Rafah, because it's where you have the, just the underground tunnel of weapons and personnel going into Gaza from the world from, through Egypt. Uh, so Israel needs to take control of Rafah as well. So uh, that's what's going on. In the meantime, as I said in the headlines, um, this morning we woke up to uh, a videotaped uh, statement or report by uh, one of the members of the uh, IDF unit uh, protecting the communities in the South Hebron Hills uh, showing a terror tunnel that had just been exposed by uh, the security unit for the communities in the South Hebron Hills. And what happened was the PA, the Palestinian Authority, which is funded and supported by the United States, which insists that it's a moderate uh, peace partner for Israel, that they've been directing, this is part of a long-term strategy, of the uh, people in Judea and Samaria, the, the Palestinians, to seize uh, state land that's controlled by Israel in Area C and areas that abut Israeli communities to threaten them. So in the town of Tarkumia, a Palestinian village in the South Hebron Hills, the PA was urging uh, Tarkumia residents to the squat in government land, Israeli government land, adjacent to the communities of Telem and Adula in the South Hebron Hills. And the residents of Adula and Telem had been telling the local uh, security units, look, we're hearing drilling. Um, adjacent to our homes, right by our homes. And so the security unit went out to look what was happening. And in the fields outside of Telem, they found a hidden tunnel, which was five to 10 meters deep. Uh, and it uh, was already, you know, with, with a ladder going down and it had two uh, small rooms that were already dug out and the beginnings of a third one. Um, so that, uh, is uh, very disturbing. And then in the 
Sudanese in South Samaria by the Sharon region, where you have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, major population centers of Israel, the residents of uh, of uh, Tsur Yigal, Kochav Yair, also have been reporting that they're hearing drilling under their homes. Uh, this is something that we were hearing in 2017, 2016, 2018 from residents of the border communities with Lebanon saying that they were hearing it. And then in 2018, the IDF did expose one of those tunnels. So now we're hearing it in the Sharon district. We've heard it in the Gilboa district, out very close to the Palestinian town of Janin in North Samaria. So uh, this is being directed by the PA, not by Hamas. This is the moderate Fatah faction that's now apparently uh, beginning a project of digging attack tunnels adjacent to or underneath Israeli communities in Judea and Samaria. So that's uh, very disturbing. Um, and then we're going to get to the third headline, which is the United States. So the headline was about what the United States was doing, attacking cabinet ministers, which I'm going to get to uh, very quickly. But first, it's worth pointing out that the U.S. response to the al uh assassination was saying, uh, look, uh, we weren't involved at all. We didn't have anything to do with this, nothing whatsoever. And in fact, we urged Israel not to take uh, take this route, not to carry out the assassination. So the United States is not only saying we weren't involved, they're saying we don't approve of what Israel is doing, which is a very interesting position to be taking because they support ostensibly Israel's determination to eradicate Hamas uh, to end the Hamas regime in Gaza, to destroy Hamas's war-making capabilities in Gaza. Um, and um, part of that, of course, is to kill all of the Hamas terror masters. And so here is the United States saying we didn't approve of that. So that's that's weird. And of course, the day before al uh was assassinated uh, on Monday, or on Sunday, actually, it was reported that uh, Lloyd Austin, the defense secretary, said we're, we're moving the USS Ford out of the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, they have no uh, naval forces in the Persian Gulf now. And uh, the uh, the Eisenhower carrier group is in the port of Aden, where it's doing basically nothing um, to, um, or at least nothing offensive against uh, the Houthis' uh, a piratical war against shipping in the Red Sea. So here's the United States saying, we didn't support this. We totally don't support a regional war, even though one is happening, right? And uh, we had nothing to do uh, with, nor do we approve of what Israel did. And that brings us to Gaza. So, and obviously in Judea and Samaria, just parenthetically, the United States totally supports the PA we talked about in the last day in focus, uh, which is that they want Israel to allow PA security forces, the people who are uh, behind these tunneling operations under Israeli communities, not only to operate in Area A, 18% of the area that they're already operating in, but also allow them to operate in Area B, uh, which is another 22%. Because, you know, why not? If they're doing this well, we should just give them more territory, and that would be a great idea. Anyway, but now let's get to Gaza. So uh, the State Department spokesman puts out, uh, and, and by the way, these are the same security forces, PA security forces tunneling under Israeli communities in Trans Samaria that the United States wants to take over Gaza. So now here's what the State Department said about Gaza uh, or about attacking our cabinet ministers. Matthew Miller, the State Department spokesman, I'm just going to read it, it's not very long, says this. The United States rejects recent statements from Israeli ministers Bezal Smotrich and Itamar Ben-Gvir advocating for the resettlement of Palestinians outside of Gaza. This rhetoric is inflammatory and irresponsible. We have been told repeatedly and consistently by the government of Israel, including the prime minister, that such statements do not reflect the policy of the Israeli government. They should stop immediately. Shut up, is what they're telling them. Then they go on. We have been, or, uh, we have been clear, consistent, and unequivocal that Gaza is Palestinian land and will remain Palestinian land with no Hamas no longer uh, with no with Hamas no longer in control of its future and with no terror groups able to threaten Israel, uh, that is the future we seek in the interests of Israelis and Palestinians, the surrounding region, and the world. So we have been clear, consistent, and unequivocal that Gaza is Palestinian land and will remain Palestinian land. So no Jews allowed, right? That's what they're saying. And also, you're not allowed to touch the Palestinians of Gaza. So 
what are we to make of this? You know, what what is this policy? So first of all, we have to note that this is a consistent policy of the United States since October 8th, right? Um, Tony Blinken uh, said it uh, repeatedly uh, that the United States does not want Israel to have any uh, security zone inside of Gaza, that Israel can seize no part of Gaza, not one centimeter. It all belongs to the Palestinians. Um, and the United States has refused to pressure Egypt, a major recipient of U.S. aid, uh, to uh, open up its border to allow the people of Gaza to leave, unlike uh, people in every other war zone in the world, including Syria, including Iraq, including Afghanistan, including Ukraine, where you've had millions of people leave war zones to third countries to seek uh, uh, safety, to seek refuge, to seek freedom, whatever. The United States says in relation to Gaza, absolutely not. Nobody's allowed to leave. Everybody has to stay. They also say, of course, humanitarian aid has to get in. Israel has to provide it. Israel is responsible for the welfare of the Gazans. And not only that, but um, it has to go through the UN. So these positions are completely in crazy in terms of what the United States says that its goal is, which is uh, with uh, Hamas no longer in control of Gaza, because UNRWA, the UN agency that uh, is it, that the United States insists is responsible for distributing the humanitarian aid, is, is Hamas. All of its directors are Hamas terrorists. All of its regional uh, employees in all the different regions of Gaza are Hamas terrorists. All of its, uh, all of its installations are Hamas uh, missile launching sites, weapons depots, and bases of operation. There are tunnel entrances underneath uh, these UNRWA offices, UN schools, etc. This is uh, they are they are integral components of of Hamas and its war machine against Israel. So uh, here's the United States saying, use Hamas to distribute. Uh, aid. And as a result, the only people who receive the humanitarian aid that the United States has insisted Israel permit into Gaza are Hamas terrorists and Hamas loyalists. And the people that the United States ostensibly cares the most about are people who are not allowed to leave Gaza and don't receive any humanitarian aid. So it's working exactly the opposite of what the United States claims its policy is, but whatever. So here's the United States saying, not only is Israel not allowed to work towards a resettlement, of Gazans, but actually, uh, any Israeli minister who who says anything publicly about the goal is going to be attacked by name by the State Department, which is pretty incredible. And I mean, we didn't see any any kind of statement say against Palestinian Authority leader Fatah leader um, uh, Jibril Rajoub, who uh, attacked Israel for assassinating Al Aruri or called for genocide against Israel, praise Hitler, et cetera. No, uh, Jabril Rajub is okay. No, he's never been condemned, but for the sin of saying that Gazans should be allowed to resettle outside, uh, the United States personally condemns Itamar Ben-Gvir and Bezal Smotrich, who again have constituencies, and it's not even just their voters. A poll of Israelis that came out like 10 days ago showed that 83% of Israelis, 83%, that's basically a consensus of Israelis because the polling data, it, it, the sample included Israeli Jews and Arabs, and Israeli Jews make up about 80% of Israeli population. So is 83% of Israelis support voluntary resettlement of the Palestinians outside of Gaza. So that's like every Israeli, right? 80, 83% of the total population of Israel in a representative sample says they support the voluntary resettlement of Gaza and more than the Gazans and more than that, Khalil Shkaki, who is the brother of Fatri Shkaki, the founder of the Islamic Jihad, who was assassinated by Israeli commandos in Malta in 1986. His brother is a leading Palestinian pollster. He operates out of Ramallah. And he did a poll of Gazans that showed that a million of them want to leave. So you have a million Gazans who want to leave. That's either half or, or, um, or three quarters of Gazans, depending on how you count them. Some people say there are 1.4 million. Some people say there are 2 million, whatever. So, but a, a million of them want to leave. 83% of Israelis think that they should, you know, be encouraged to leave. And here's the U.S. government saying nobody's allowed to leave. Nobody's allowed to leave. Israel's not allowed to do anything in Gaza, you know. And the weirdest thing about it is that just looking at the destruction that's already happened in the course of this war, certainly northern Gaza, which makes up like 
forty percent of the land north of the the riverbed, the uh, Gaza River riverbed. Um, you know, that's not going to be suitable for human habitation for at least a year. And who's going to pay to rebuild it when it's still a battle scene between Israel and Hamas that are all, you know, coming up from under Viet Cong tunnels and shooting at Israeli military personnel? Like nobody, right? And so what is the United States talking about? It's saying that, what, for the foreseeable future, these people have to live in, in tents? Why? And I mean, and, and starve because Hamas isn't going to give them any food? or become Hamas terrorists so that they get food. I mean, this is a crazy policy and it's not supported by the Israeli people, which means that it's really irrelevant and irrational. And and that's really the thing. Like when you look at the United States saying, we don't want an escalation in Gaza, we, you know, pinpoint strikes, pinpoint strikes when we're hitting targets that are 50, 50 meters below ground, you need bunker busters, you need 2000 pound bombs for those things. So what are you talking about pinpoint strikes when you're dealing with subterranean tunnels? You know, what are you talking about when you're dealing with a regime, when you're dealing with a society that supports a regime that's genocidal and jihadistic? I mean, like, you're, you're, you're a joke. And then you say, and you, you don't allow the people who want to leave to leave. You don't allow the people who want them to leave to help them leave. You're saying our, our policy is to completely ignore reality. But the problem is, is that the reality is, at the end of the day, going to will out because there's no way that this can continue on any longer after October 7th. I mean, there were a lot of Israelis who woke up on that day, right, to reality. They had been living in La La Land for 30 years. You know, the people of Be'eri, the people of Nachal Oz, of Nir Oz, the people of Kfar Aza who were slaughtered that day, you know, they, they woke up. They had thought for 30 years, at least, that just like America insists, right, that there are moderates on both sides, that the PLO is moderate, just like they're moderate, secular, anti-religious Israelis, and then the religious Israelis and Hamas are the extremists, and the job is to get in partnership between the moderates on both sides and to kick out the extremists on both sides. And in Israel, that means, you know, a letting uh, Palestinian authority take over Judea and Samaria and kick all the Jews out, just like happened in Gaza. And then all Hamas needs is to get a lot of money, get jobs, and then everybody will hate them, and they'll all become bourgeoisie, middle-class people, just like you and me, and they'll be fine. And in the event, it worked out that that's totally not true. Not only did Hamas come in and kill all of the Israeli moderates that they could get their hands on and slaughtered them, didn't just kill them, but they were wildly supported by the moderate Palestinians from Fatah, right, who just who the ones in Gaza came in and invaded, and the one in, in Judea and Samaria applauded and glorified Hamas and support them even you know more raucously than the Palestinians in Judea in, in Gaza do. Um, yeah, 86% of them think that it's fantastic what happened on October 7th. So there are no moderates among the Palestinians, and the Jews who came in and saved the people of Be'eri and saved the people of Nir Oz, they're religious. I mean, in, in Berry, in particular, a quarter of the people of Berry were saved by the Collinson brothers. I wrote an article about them. You should check it out on JNS. And so then suddenly they see, wait, these people aren't extremists. These people aren't our enemies. They're our brothers. And it's interesting when we get to the Supreme Court, which is the last story I want to talk about today. So yesterday I, uh, I heard that these reservists had come out from Gaza and set up this protest tent Outside the palace, outside of the prime minister's office in Jerusalem, to demand that they be allowed to fight to victory. Like this sounds interesting. In fact, it sounds a bit like a pick me up. So I figured, you know what? Uh, go be a reporter. Go check it out. Go see what's going on. So I got in my car and I drove over to the prime minister's office and I went into the protest tent to check it out. And it was incredible. I talked to a lot of the men who were there, and these are people who have been serving all over in the north, in Gaza. Uh, there were a bunch of them that had been serving in, in Jabalia. Um, and then in the Jordan Valley, where we've had a lot of operations by the Jordanian military, that's very frightening right across the border, um, and in other areas of uh, Judea and Syria. So they were from all, all of the various fronts. And uh, what they were saying was, look, you know, I just finished 54 days in the north. I just finished... You know, I've been in Gaza, you know, I've been mobilized, all of them had been mobilized on October 7th with emergency orders, and some of them had been released just now, and some of them were on furlough. 
And instead of going home to their wives and kids, they came to the prime minister's office. They said, we feel like uh, there's a lower intensity of the fighting. We feel like you know the government is bowing to these American demands for the humanitarian assistance to come in and we're resupplying Hamas and all, all of these other things. We can't allow Hezbollah to sit on the border. We have to fight them. And so here are these reservists. They're saying, you know, we want to continue to risk our lives uh, for this country because this country is not safe right now. We have to keep going. We have to make sure that the government keeps its pledge to fight this war to total victory. We cannot relent. We cannot stop. Uh, this has to go on. And I, I came home. I mean, I was so moved listening to them. And I came home and I just felt like I could, you know, sigh, a sigh of relief. Okay, you know, we're not going to give up because the people of this country are not going to let the government bow to pressure. It's just not going to happen. Like, if the, I mean, this is crazy. Like, reservists coming and demanding to go back into the battlefield because we haven't finished the job. It, it it's they're right. You know, obviously they're correct. And here they are, and they're they're not going to go quietly into that. You know, good night. No way. You know, they want they. We have a war. We must fight it. We must win. We must defeat the enemy. And they're demanding, and that brings me to the building across the street from the prime minister's office, which is the Supreme Court. So I don't want to belabor it too much, but uh, just for knowing, um, this week uh, the Supreme Court released a judgment that essentially ended Israel's Israel's democratic system of government. And sort of the closest form of government you might find to this is the um, is the Iranian regime, because the Iranian regime you have like these high priests of, of jihadist Islam who led by Khamenei, the Council of Elders or whatever they're called, and they tell the Iranian parliament what they can and cannot discuss. They tell the Iranian government what they can and cannot do. They control the Iranian military. They control the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, the Praetorian Guard of the regime, and, and a more powerful military organization than the Iranian military itself. So they control all aspects of life in Iran, the mil the media, everything is controlled by this council of holy jihadists and um they direct everything else. They are they are they are the uh they are the supreme leaders of Iran. And um the court's judgment just said that, you know, they get uh to decide which we don't have a constitution here in Israel. Uh, in the 1990s, Supreme Court president at the time, Arun Barak, the father of our judicial uh, aristocracy, our judicial uh, uh, dictatorship, uh, he determined that Israel's basic laws, which are just sort of like these laws that establish the powers of various uh, uh, um, arms of government and then sort of set out the values that direct Israel. So it's kind of like a constitution, but it, it wasn't really seen as a constitution. You don't have a constitution, but Barack decided that the basic laws were the Constitution, and then the Supreme Court is allowed to interpret them as a basis for deciding whether Israel is abiding by what he says the Constitution is or not. And so that was the basis of the judicial revolution that he enacted in, in the 1990s. And he said that the, that the source of the power that he arrogated to the Supreme Court without any legislative writ to do so um, was based on his right to interpret basic laws. Okay, so this is the source of his power, which, and he said repeatedly that, you know, the Knesset is the one that passes the basic laws or amends the basic laws. I can't get involved with that because they're the source of my power. So don't worry, I'm not going to be a dictator because I'm not the one legislating the basic laws. So uh, the Knesset, of course, finally got tired of having all of its legislative power seized by unelected judges who select themselves. And the executive, our government, also got tired of these unelected uh, lawyers telling them what they can and cannot do in terms of uh, uh, making policy and implementing policy in this country. So um, the, one of the main rationales that the Supreme Court uses to overturn government policies and to overturn Knesset laws is they this invented concept of reasonableness, which they took roughly from uh, Britain, but the British say reasonable or unreasonable is basically mad or sane. And so if somebody's crazy and he you know, thinks it's you know, he hires his dog to be the postmaster general. Well, that's clearly unreasonable, and therefore uh, a judge can can uh, cancel the dog's appointment as a postmaster general. But um, 
that's not how they interpreted it. They interpreted the reasonableness uh, concept to mean anything that we like. So if they like a policy, then it's reasonable, or a law, then it's reasonable. If they don't like a policy or a law, then it's unreasonable. So this is a crazy idea that our justices came up with. And so the Knesset passed an amendment to the basic law judiciary and said that reasonableness cannot be the rationale for canceling laws. Okay, so it's an amendment to the basic law of the judiciary that that, that says you can't use a reasonable reasonableness uh, rationale to abrogate duly promulgated laws uh, by the Knesset or, or appointments or anything else. So um, immediately, so, okay, so the court ostensibly by its own claims, it, it, it can't do anything about it because it's basic law. Ah, uh -uh, who cares, right? So one of these radical NGOs, uh, Association for Civil Rights in Israel or something like that, um, they, they petitioned the court immediately and called for the court to uh, cancel the amendment to the basic law, over which the you know the the, the court itself says it can't do anything; it has no power because that's the source of its authority. And Esther Chayud, who was just retiring, she's about to retire as the president of the Supreme Court. She said, "Oh, great, we'll take it." And she was supposed to retire. She retired on like August, October fifteenth. So in September, she has these marathon hearings. We talked about it at the time, and. Um, she had, like, she retired on October 15th, and she's only allowed to uh, be counted in judgment for any of the petitions that she sat on for the three months after her official uh, retirement, mandatory retirement, she turned 70. And so that means, like, I think January 15th, January 16th. So she's in a rush. Why? Because there are 15 justices in the Supreme Court. She had all of them sitting on this petition because she wanted to show, you know, the judges totally are in agreement that this is really bad. And it worked out that, no, actually what she had was an 8-7 majority with her vote and the vote of this other justice, Associate Justice Adat Barone, who also retired in October. So they both have only until mid-January to put out this judgment. And if they're not signed on to it, then the amendment stands because it goes from an 8-7 majority to a 7-6 uh, minority or 7-6 majority to keep the law, to keep the amendment. So they had to put it out immediately. So what that means is that the Knesset has no right to promulgate any laws that are constitutional if the Supreme Court doesn't like them and the government has no right. So that means that there's basically no power to the Knesset and there's no power to the government because the Supreme Court gets to decide everything. So that means that we have a council of guardians, uh, just like in uh, Iran, that gets to decide everything. And our elected officials are basically just pawns that can be moved around the chessboard by these unelected, self-selected justices. So that's what happened. And, you know, people are trying to stir up an uproar about this because it's really bad, you know, to like cancel uh, democracy and all that. And it, But the problem is we're in war and we have reservists coming you know, across the street from the court. I mean, they're not telling the justices we have to fight to victory. They're telling the people they elected. We got to fight to victory, Bibi. We elected you prime minister, or all of your ministers. We elected you to be ministers. You, you guys have to fight this to victory. It's bring us back. Send us back to the battles. You know, we, we want to win this war. We have to win this war. So they're not going to the Supreme Court. We didn't vote for them. They voted for themselves. And I'm sitting there with the reservists, and I'm looking at the Supreme Court, and I'm thinking... How seriously do I have to take this judgment? And I know I have to take it seriously because essentially there's no way to get around it, right? Like there's nothing we can do about it. But it's hard because these people, it's like the Americans pretend, you know, thinking that the position of 83% of Israelis and the position of a million Palestinians who live in Gaza is totally uh, worthless and it's completely irrelevant because what they're saying is that all of these Gazans have to stay in Gaza. It's like, yeah, right, you know, fine. Oh, and there's going to be no war in Lebanon because America says, yeah, right, because we're going to leave 100,000 Israelis homeless and we're going to accept that northern Israel is uninhabit in uninhabitable and we're, you know, going to let Hamas stay in Gaza because you can't really defeat them this way. Like, we're going to lose this war. We're going to totally lose this war. We're going to empower the Palestinian Authority forces that are tunneling under communities in Judea and Samaria to be in charge of Gaza also. We're going to give them a state. Like, this stuff makes no sense. And the same kind of feelings you have with the Supreme Court. Like, really, guys? You think that this is going to work? 
You know, so I don't know. I mean, we're going to, after the war, the government is playing this right. I mean, it's playing it the only way that's re relevant, which is they're saying, look, you know, we can't deal with this until after the war. And they're right. Nobody can. But I know I'm supposed to be really upset about this because, hello, I like democracy. I vote, you know, stuff like that. You know, I want to have a say in the governance of my country. I would never have voted any of these justices to be in charge. Uh, so it's really bad. But it's also really weird like n who cares what they think it doesn't matter we have a country we have to defend and protect and save and these justices made a really bad they're acting like politicians but they don't understand politics you can't ignore you can't declare the the will of the people of israel gone constitutional it just it makes no sense and so i i'm worried about what the americans are doing because if they end up getting their way that means that israel loses this war in a catastrophic defeat on all fronts. But we're not going to let that happen. And the same thing with the Supreme Court. So this is all very bad. But October 7th was was one of those moments in time where there's a before and there's an after. And the two, they, they're, they're not the same. And people who want to live in October 6th in a post-October 7th world are not going to get their way because there's just no way they can. So anyway, those are my thoughts, and I'll talk to you again next week. Take care.